Okay. Uh, good afternoon, everyone. My name is Hong Fu Deng from Vietnam. I run a uh, Force Asia organization supporting um, open source and free software movement in Asia. We are connected with many developer communities. And of course, DBN is uh, one of our favorites. So we, we host, I think, two media dev cons at, at our Force Asia annual summit in the past. But this is my first time in DevCon. I'm, I'm really happy to be here. And um, <laughs> okay, so I have here on stage with me six excellent developers, DBN developers, coming from very diverse backgrounds, and especially they come from six different regions around the world. So today, they will share with us their life story, experiences, challenging working in the community, and also they will suggest ideas and best practices how we can scale and sustain uh, projects within uh, DBN. With that, I will start to briefly introduce our panelists. I will start with um, Bidel Gabi. He's from the US. He's probably the earliest DBN contributor here in the room. Started in 1994, 24 years with the project. Yeah, I was blown away by reading about all his work in the Wikipedia page. It is an honor to have you here with us. Thank you. And um, super happy to have uh, Debbie Brevo uh, from a very special place, Tahiti. Yeah. Anyone here have been to Tahiti? Do you know where that is? <laughs> well, Devi perhaps could tell you more later. So Devi right now working is as a high school teacher um, for... Um, the French government? Yeah, for the French government. Okay, yeah, the, you, you can explain more later. Uh, I met Devi last night, and my first impression was you're really friendly and very helpful. So thank you very much for showing me around the way and everything. And I have here um, Jonathan Carter from South Africa. Yeah, Jonathan actually became a DBN developer early last year. It's a very special story about his journey and his relationship with DBN, which you will share with the audience later. Yeah, and um, Hideki Yamane, yeah, from Japan, right? And so um, maybe you already know um, Hideki, he played a very important role in growing the, commu the local community in Japan. He also a um, tech writer for a local magazine. Yeah. And I have here, um, I try to, uh, how to say your name correctly, Ho Sui Ortega from Guatemala. Even though he looks very young, he actually has more than 10 years experience as a free software advocate. And uh, he also a member of the Software Libre Guatemala, which is a very important organization that fosters free software movement in the country. And uh, last but not least, I have here with me uh, Nicola, um, uh, Nicola de Montre. Yeah, thank you. <laughs> so uh, Nicola is actually one of the organizers of this DevCon. If you haven't uh, noticed that, he's the man behind the scene. Yeah, but not only this DevCon, but many other um, uh, events. And thank, I know you are very busy, but thank you very much for taking this one hour here with us. And uh, seeing I have you here, thank you and the team for booting up such an amazing event. For us. Thank you very much. <laughs> okay, so um, to kick things off, I would like to ask each panelist this question. What brought you to DBN in the first place? And what is your current goal? What is um, your involvement in DBN these days? And finally, uh, finally, please tell us one thing about you that people he wouldn't know. So I will start with uh, Bidel. OK, let's see. Um, the story of how I became involved in Debian is actually kind of long and involved, but interesting. Uh, there was a reporter in the UK several years ago who published a lengthy interview with me with lots and lots of details. The very short version is that I was involved in a project to develop a payload for an amateur radio satellite. 
and I was collaborating with people in many different countries, and this was before Linux had become a really big deal. And one of my friends started using uh, Linux as his platform for working on the project, and that caused me to begin to take Linux seriously, and I started looking for which sort of version of Linux I should play with, and I discovered uh, that there was an effort to figure out how to use Debian for doing ham radio related work. And that's sort of the thing that brought me into the project. Um, I got sucked in very, very quickly. And within uh, two or three months of joining the project, I had taken over several packages, was maintaining different pieces of software, had built the first server that was fully dedicated for Debian use and uh, had become sort of very involved in the center of the project. That was in late 1994. Um, something about me that people don't know. Um, well, okay, uh, today, um, I've done lots of things in the project. Those of you who know me will recall that I was Debian project leader at one point. I spent almost 10 years as chairman of the Debian technical committee. And I've been involved in all sorts of craziness over the years in terms of architecture for our infrastructure in the project and, and some other things, big decisions uh, over the years. Uh, today, um, I'm actually retired in the corporate world, and the things I still do for Debian are to maintain a few base essential packages, things like gzip and tar and sudo, which I've been working on fixing some bugs in today. Um, and something that people don't know about me, boy, that's... Um, actually, many people have been immensely surprised that uh, given the amount of travel I did during my corporate career, this is the first time I've ever been in Taiwan. So there's something most people don't know about me. <laughs> well, just a, a quick question there. So I just heard over the break that you also run your own company that develop hardware for rocketry. Do people here know about this? Yeah, actually, almost everybody in Debian <laughs> knows about that. But for those who don't and those who are watching on the video stream, um, uh, Keith Packard and I are partners in a small company that does open hardware and open source solutions for the electronics that are used in high power model rockets, which is a hobby thing. Um, I've also personally built electronics that's now on satellites that are in orbit and lots of other stuff like that. Um, but yeah, it's enough about me, other folks. Have sure I have things to say. Okay, sure. Thank you. Thank you. Hi. Um, so to answer the question, I will get involved in the project. Um, How did you start it with uh, Debian? In the, yeah. yeah. And um, well, I had quite a busy life um, 15 years ago when I was living in Paris. And after that, when I moved uh, overseas in a, in a little island, I began to manage to much time uh, in front of me. and. Uh, could finally use that time to do something constructive about uh, the tools I was actually using. And that's why uh, our, uh, it was uh, the, the tips that made me uh, some, free, freed me some time actually to contribute. And, uh, and first thing that I, uh, I met because I, I was not in the computer world actually, uh, was to, um, to help the translation project to, um, to help people uh, um, who don't speak uh, English very well, like me, as you can see, to, um, to actually be uh, able to install software or understand the documentation. And um, that's, uh, that's what drove me in the, in the beginning. And once you get involved, you, you, if you're happy with uh, the project, you, you do more. And that's, uh, that's how I came involved in that, in that project. And uh, say someone, something that's some people might not know about me. It's pretty hard. Uh, I don't know. Maybe, maybe you don't know, but I very much like rabbits. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> Cheers. Thank you. So um, my Debian story and how I got there is also a long and twisty road. So I'll try to make a short version of it. But uh, in 2000, when I finished high school. Um, my family wasn't doing so well, so there wasn't a way for me to go to university. So I just continued support doing a bunch of IT work around the neighborhood and a few companies I knew. And 
at this stage, I discovered Linux and played with it more and more and uh, found that I can do a lot of things that I did with Windows servers just with Linux, you know, just installing Apache and um, Samba already blew my mind. So I started doing this for all the companies I supported already and found that it was great. And uh, I thought I should really get um, Linux into schools and teach other high school kids how to use Linux and how to administer it. So at this point, I posted about it on a Linux user group. And at this point, the Shuttleworth Foundation, who was also on that Linux user group, um, was talking about um, getting thin clients into schools for educational purposes. So I thought, oh, this is great, I should get in touch, um, because I could piggyback on that to teach Linux in schools. And uh, so a year later, I started working for them full time, and it uh, snowballed into a lot of things. I became a Ubuntu contributor, and uh, later on a Motu, and by 2012, I um, joined my first DevConf, and then things snowballed into the Debian direction from there on. Um, so yeah, and last year I finally uh, became a Debian developer. So that's, that's it in a nutshell. Um, something that someone might not know about me, um, I'm a big Star Trek fan. That's all I can think of right now. Thank you. Oh. <laughs> Hi, uh, I was, uh, I started to use Linux as a, a system administrator in small company and uh, because there's no money, so I should use Linux for the uh, proxy or DNS or web server and uh, there are people in the uh, Debian people in Linux users group, local user group. So I choose Debian for the first choice. And I asked many questions to local mailing list. Then I thought uh, I want the answer from the reliable people. Uh, then what should I do for it? Then, and uh, I, I thought, if I, I'm a kind of a contributor, they, they probably uh, don't ignore me. <laughs> if, if there is a people and uh, just a user and the contributor, probably they choose the, the questions from the contributors, I thought. So I started to work in about the uh, uh, translation work because I'm not good at English so I don't read much English at school <laughs> so I studied to uh, the translation uh, DevConf message uh, from English to Japanese that's the uh, start, uh, that, uh, start of my Debian contribution uh, recently I play with some packages uh, like DevTostrap. How many uses DevTostrap? Oh, thank you. <laughs> and uh, fix bugs and uh, make some regressions and uh, some people uh, angry with me. Hey, it's okay. Why? Why you update this package? <coughs> <laughs> but uh, it, it, it's a fun time to, for me to to get some reaction from users. Uh, that's all. Well, my first approach with Debian was in the university with the compilers course. For some reason, it was a requirement to install Debian to run some Java Lexer tool. So I installed it, and I really like it. Uh, then I went to DevCon 2012, and I really loved the community. It was like, oh, I need to be part of this. So I started to contribute maybe two months after DevCon. And then I become a DD two years ago. Um, actually, yeah, and one of the most things I like is I started contributing with the Debian Astro team, which I am kind of astronomy um, fan. So I'm kind of contributing with uh, a lot of people in, in the ast astronomy community. Uh, one thing you don't know about me is like I'm a hobbies bass player, so that's all. 
Hi. Um, so uh, I started using uh, Linux when I was a high school student. Uh, I was using Gentoo back then because like watching compilation lines scroll by was cool. Um, and when I started university, um, I became involved in the student ISP there, uh, and all the servers were running Debian. Uh, so I started like using Debian uh, to understand what was going on, and. I guess I had to package something, and I started getting involved in packaging, uh, and then the infrastructure to actually submit packages wasn't that good, so I contributed there, and then I got root access to the server. Um, <laughs> And so basically, yeah, you just put your hand in a small cog and then your arm gets sucked in and you keep contributing, I guess. Um, one thing that people might not know about me is that I watch like way too many TV shows, <laughs> like a lot. What kind of show do you watch? Oh, uh, one of the last things that I rewatched was Halt and Catch Fire. Halt and Catch Fire. Very good show about the 80s. Okay, so uh, before I move on to the next question, I just want to ask the audience quickly how many of you here are non Debian contributors? You want to be in the future, but you are not yet Debian contributors. Could you please raise your hand? Okay, good. <laughs> good. Okay, so uh, back to the next question. What is your greatest accomplishment or your proudest mom uh, moment during your Debian time? I will start with Nicola. So um, during my time in Debian, I've contributed to the outreach team, uh, which uh, runs uh, Google Summer of Code and Outreachy uh, internships in Debian. And I think the thing that I'm the most proud of is uh, making sure that the project keeps funding Outreachy internships uh, in a regular manner uh, so that uh, people can get involved in the project under represented groups. Uh, a question for you. So um, do you need to be a DBN contributor to join the outreach team or is it open for anyone to how like what are the qualification to be to be so um, if I guess if you have some, I'm, I'm not currently involved in the outreach team anymore, but if you have something that you want to be done inside Debian and you're not a contributor yet, I think you're going to be accepted as a mentor uh, inside the team mm -hmm. uh, and actually get like an internship slot, slot to do the project that you want to include in Debian. Um, it's way easier if you're already uh, maybe known in the community, but it's not a strong requirement. Thank you. And of course, if you want to do an internship, then yeah, uh, new, uh, new contributors are of course welcome. Um, the same question for Jose. Well, my, one of the things I'm proud of is the packaging of Gloovis, which is a data analysis tool which and I make helps to analyze uh, astronomical data. So it, it took me like a packaging a lot of stuff to, to bring all the stuff to Debian. And I, I really like that. But actually, uh, I really enjoy every time I close a bug because I know it, there's a lot of people is relying on Debian packages. So I'm just there to help them. So that's all. Uh, uh, question on the bug. So do you remember any like very difficult Bug and how much time did you spend on the the hardest bug in your life so far? Oh, there will be plenty. Probably w once with PySBN, which is not related with. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, but it's really hard package and it's, uh, you, I, you, I, it's, it's really hard to keep it building in a lot of architectures. So that's one of. How much time did you spend on it? Or oh, maybe two weeks. Two weeks. Yeah, or something like that. Yeah. Okay. Um, uh, you have a question? Uh, so we'll, we'll leave some time at the end for questions. <laughs> we only have two minutes. So, uh, as she said, uh, I'm a tech writer. 
so I am writing the Debian article in Japanese tech magazine for five years. So I spread the Debian information around the, the people in Japan. Okay, so um, I have a question about um, when people talk about Japan, they always talk about the Japanese manga. Like it's really popular yes, uh, yes, for popular. Japanese people. <laughs> because the, my nick is the picture the Japanese manga character. Uh -huh. Do you have plan to make a Debian manga so the, to promote uh, ah, the project? The, there was the Ubuntu manga. I know, I know the author because uh, I'm the op I'm also the uh, Ubuntu local Japanese team, mm -hmm. but uh, the magazine was suspended <laughs> um, because of the the company issue there. Mm, it's it's nice if I can see the uh, and uh, read the the Debian pip uh, Debian manga and the better. I saw some the hacker comic in Japan. The character uses Debian. Uh -huh. Oh, oh that, that's a swear with, oh, he, he uses Debian, mm -hmm. I guess. OK, so another question for you. So you said that um, you, you are a writer for a local magazine. So magazine yes. is like a very traditional media mm. that could have to um, in, send out the message to, to the public. Mm. Are there more tech writers like you in Japan about Debian? Mm. Anyone? Are there more tech writers mm. like you about Debian? Or do you have any plan that how to, to get more people to become writer? There's a lot of money. Oh no! <laughs> Is there any incentive? Do you get paid by writing for the magazine? Yes, I got, but uh, it's not so much. I spend uh, every weekend, uh, and uh, but uh, mm, the the return is not so much because uh, probably you know to check the check the tech issue is so hard to to reproduce or uh, to to use the correct word is check the checking the correct word is hard and uh, it's <laughs> i i want more people to get involved to write about debian but if you want more money i don't i don't <laughs> <laughs> well, it's it's not a money issue. Yeah. It, it's it's a it's a kind of love. Yeah. So I think the motivation could be to have your name on, on a printed paper. Now everything online, but now you, you get open a book, open a magazine, it's your name right there. I think it could be a good motivation for people here who want to write about DBN. So there's a few things that. Uh, that I was proud of in Debian. One thing wasn't really my fault, but that was how well DebConf 16 went in Cape Town, which is my home city. That was really a nice DebConf, and I still have people telling me, oh, that was a great DebConf. I'm, like, I'm glad too, but I was just a very small part of it. But um, th that's definitely one thing that stands out for me. But also, um, during the stretch release, I did a lot of testing on the, the testing images that were available and filed some bugs and fixed one or two of them as well. And that's something I'm really happy with. And I'd also suggest to anyone who wants to get involved into Debian, um, testing the pre-release images is extremely useful and valuable to the project. And it's a good way to get exposure to many parts of the project as well. Um, because you learn to file bugs, you learn to try to reproduce other people's bugs. Um, so it's a good idea to keep a watch on when uh, um, alphas and betas are released, and especially the final images. And uh, yeah, install something like VirtualBox or QMU on your machine, and learn to install Debian images on there, and that that will get you a long way to get involved with Debian. Um, a question for you. I'm just curious, what is so good about the DevCon in Cape Town? I think many people here haven't been to Cape Town before. <laughs> what is this, uh, What is so good? Well, it was a lot cooler and not as you. <laughs> <laughs> The, um, the, Jonathan, the, we just started today. We haven't finished DevCon yet. True, true. Okay? You can't uh, tell. 
and we had lots of spaces to relax and sit around and chat. And uh, the social aspect of it was really good. And I think that makes a big difference. OK. But we can't tell if this is not better. You know, we have to wait until the end. Sure. <laughs> yeah. Maybe? Um, one of the things uh, I was, I've been most happy to, when I was contributing to Debian, was, was the, actually the first time, the first time I wrote a bug report that was uh, actually acknowledged by the maintainer. The first time I proposed a patch that was accepted by the maintainer. The first time I made my own upload. The first time I'm, I met uh, actual Debian developer in real life. Uh, that has that are the things that made me personally happy. And uh, for the things that I'm most proud of, that might be the, the people around me that are now using Debian, uh, just because uh, uh, showing them uh, there's something uh, that works, that is uh, uh, interesting, that, that might solve your problem. And, and so the, those people, uh, either around me or, or further away, but, but I know uh, I contributed for, for them to actually use Debian. Or, or go further, and that, that makes me yeah, proud to be in the project for that. I think that it's very important to get people around you to use mm -hmm. Debian. Not a question for you. <laughs> so you are a high school teacher. Yeah. Do all your students use Debian? Sorry? Your students, do they all use Debian? Uh, actually, uh, we, at the school when I'm, where I'm currently, we, we don't use Debian on the, on the computer. But uh, a few years ago, I managed to, because I, I'm a teacher in mechanical engineering, and some of these software are not running under uh, um, uh, Unix bias, uh, bias uh, computer. But uh, a few years ago, I managed to, to teach uh, some computer science. So uh, I was able to install my own servers, uh, install the, uh, the actual cli clients. So I ran Debian Edu. That's why I got involved in the Debian Edu project at the time. Right? And um, um, yes, there was more than one room that, is, that was running Debian, that is still running Debian, actually, in, uh, in Martinique. And um, at least one of the students uh, of mine, where, uh, after a few months, uh, came back uh, and, uh, and showed me his computer. And told me, oh, now it's running Debian, and now it's running. So yes, that works. Oh, okay. So, but I think, you know, uh, I have a story of one um, Force Asia member who is also a high school teacher. So being a teacher gives you a lot of opportunity. You can just teach anything you want, even though there is a lesson plan that you need to follow. But you can get the student together one evening and, and try to do something extra that, get, that lead them into one direction. So I think that being a teacher is a really um, cool uh, position to, to have the impact in the young generation. So thank you very much, and hope that you continue to teach uh, Debian to more people. Thank you. Well, things I'm proud of. Um, it's really hard to winnow that down to just one, so I won't. I'll mention three. Um, one of them is that um, because my corporate professional career uh, caused me to travel an immense amount around the world, uh, many of you who know me know that there were several years where I did more than 400,000 flight miles per year. And in that crazy period, um, one of the things I got to do was to meet people in different countries who were interested in Debian but didn't have any way to get their key signed so they could start the process of becoming a Debian developer. I can think of at least three countries where the first DD in that country was able to join the project because I visited their country on business and was able to meet them and sign their key. And so that was, that's something I thought was really cool at the time. Um, the second thing is that there was a year when I was invited to attend the Linux Kernel Summit on behalf of my employer to talk about what my employer needed from the kernel community. And I took advantage of that opportunity to rip off my HP shirt, exposing my Debian swirl t-shirt underneath, and ask the kernel community the question, is Debian violating its social contract by shipping the Linux kernel in Maine? And that was the beginning of the discussion about getting all the binary firmware blobs out of the kernel, which took several years of work. And the kernel community had to buy in and agree to work on that, but the way we handle firmware for I.O. devices around the Linux kernel today, uh, I, think, I think the only reason that work ever got done is that someone like me was willing to stand up and in some way sort of embarrass the kernel community about the issue and get them to take it seriously. 
Um, but I guess on some level, the thing I'm probably personally the most proud of in Debian is that today, <laughs> when people talk about Debian, many of the things they talk about as being significant and important are things that I articulated in the second DPL election platform that I wrote the year that I actually got elected. Um, and there are things like the importance of internationalization, um, the use of the universal operating system as a meme for the project. I'm not the one who came up with that phrase, but I elevated it in my DPL platform that year, and it's been around forever. And one other stupid little thing is that when I was the Debian project leader, I started a, a habit of writing bits from the DPL and where the bits thing came from is a very long story, but it amuses me now every time I see a status report from some Debian team that says bits from, because that's something I introduced to the project as a meme. So. <laughs> oh, sorry, that was actually four. <laughs> I, I totally understand. It must be very hard for you to pick something like in your four, 24 years of history working in the, in the, the community. There are certainly <laughs> moments that are even more infamous to the crowd, but they're not necessarily things I'm proud of. So, <laughs> and so I know the audience we have more questions for you, but I have a like off the topic question a little bit. Uh, so you said that you travel so much, but this is your first time in in Taiwan. Uh, do you have any uh, goal that you want to achieve during this trip, or getting partner for the drug three companies, or, or something that you you want to achieve? Right now, I'm just trying not to melt. After that, we'll, <laughs> we'll figure it out. <laughs> um, actually, I'm, I'm very excited to be here because um, I've had lots of business relationships over the years with companies in Taiwan, and I don't actually know. I can't really understand how it is that I never had a reason to travel here. But um, it's been very interesting already, and I'm looking forward to some of the things we'll see on the day trips and so on. So, Thank you. OK. so. Um, Let's move on to um, the next question. Yeah, uh, what do you see as current challenges in the community, and do you um, have any idea suggestion for better scaling and sustainability? Uh, who would like to start first? You can decide. I guess I can start. Um, I think what I see uh, in the community is uh, gradually more diversity in the people that are represented inside the community. Um, and I think this is like really critical for the long-term sustainability of the project, having like people from different backgrounds, from different viewpoints. Um, I think the days where the average Debian developer was a 30, 40 year old uh, Western male are uh, getting over. And I think that's good. So I hope this trend continues. Uh, before uh, just uh, to, to ask you, I just want to have you a bit here. So you, um, the question, you are an organizer of this um, DEF CON. So uh, is there anything that the audience can help you during this uh, week or anything that you want us to have for the upcoming? So uh, if you're sticking around for the conference, uh, please go to the DebConf website, click on the volunteer link on the top of the website, and uh, sign up for some shifts. And we'll be very grateful f for you. I already signed up my shift. So please go <coughs> look on the volunteer page. They, they still need more people to support. Yes. Thank you. Can you repeat the question, please? OK, so uh, what are the current challenges that you see in the community? And do you have any uh, ideas, suggestions to overcome the challenge? OK, uh, one of the big challenges, because I have noticed with the people that are around me in Guatemala, is like probably it's really hard, technically, maybe, to get to any newcomer and start contributing in Debian. So probably we need better infrastructure or better tools to, to get these people to be get easier to contribute, because sometimes you, you have to Jack shaving a lot of stuff, so that's that's the challenge I see in the community. Maybe we we need more more tools to get contributors easy, and maybe now we are using GitLab in Salsa, so maybe we'll help better to get people to contribute with the packages. Mm -hmm. So, and how big is the Debian community there in Guatemala? Do you know? Well, 
in a while was a very big community, but the people start to work or having family. Now, right now is we have we are two DDs there, but um, I'm the only active one. Uh -huh. So basically, it's just me. So do you <laughs> meet up from time to time, or how do you get connect with other people? Well, right now just IRC. Uh -huh. The yeah, that's kind of the problem because there are the industry, the software industry over there is more like. Private, private, private software, Microsoft is pushing a lot in the universities, so people is not using Linux at all. So it's really, really hard to convince people to show them because they are like, oh, money, money, or something like that. So mm -hmm. they are not contributing for, for passion or something. Like that. Yeah, so it's the same question we have in Asia, but maybe the audience could, have, uh, could help us later on. Um, the challenge, mm. the people should uh, share the current status of each other. Uh, it 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 uh, probably the becomes a chance for the contribution. Uh, people should uh, should not shout about the idea of the uh, not the package name. Uh, talk about the current problem of the the package or translation or website or um, event or any uh, uh, talk about uh, anything the current status uh, and uh, another challenge is is many. In Japan, many uh, younger people says, "Arch is cool, Debian is not." Mm -hmm. So we should make Debian cool again. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So I could talk all day about challenges, but uh, one thing that I noticed, I was I was in Rwanda two weeks ago, upgrading a computer lab there. And all the young people there only use their phones and tablets, and this is their primary computer that they use. And I've spoken to some locals in Taiwan, and they say the same thing is happening here. And if you're using Android then as your primary operating system, then it's basically a consumer device. So you don't use your device to create and um, to make things. You just consume content. You watch videos, you download games, and that's what your computer is about. So I think in the larger free software community, we have a challenge to, um, to try to make mobile devices better for creating things. And th at least on Android, you get uh, F-Droid now, which is pretty cool. It's, a, it's like Google Play, but only contains free software. And it's easy enough to use so that I can tell family and friends to install it, and they can figure out how to install the apps from their, their selves without any further involvement from my part. But uh, th there's a lot of things that's still difficult, like just getting uh, a good Python environment on uh, on an Android device is quite difficult. And uh, I think projects like uh, the Librem 5, which uh, is a phone made by Purism that will basically run Debian, will be great for many people um, who use a phone as a m m primary device. And if that can at least support some level of, uh, of, of Android app compatibility, then that will open up a huge world for people. So I hope that, as because it's it's a pity for me that we're a universal operating system, but we don't run on the most popular kind of computer that people have these days. So it feels like something that really should be solved somehow or another. I don't think there's any easy solution for it yet, but I think it's something we can think about and talk about more often. Thank you. Um, among the challenges, um, the challenges, uh, what I'm thinking of is um, uh, on the human level. Um, sometimes we are um, a group of people, when we see each other, uh, it can work, but sometimes when, when we are all in remote places, we, we only address to each other via mailing list or IRC. And uh, we come from yeah, various different places, various different <laughs> cultures, uh, and sometimes we forget it and we assume, oh, but why is this person not thinking like me? Uh, uh, and sometimes we, we begin to fight with each other, and it's, 
it's, uh, it's not going to resonate right. But when we see each other on, on real life, like uh, this kind of event, we, we remember that yeah, everyone around me is, is actually nice and I can have a real discussion. And sometimes uh, just based on the misunderstanding and, and we, we, we lose it. So, yeah, um, in order to solve that, yes, help us remember, help us remember we are a diverse, uh, diverse community and, uh, and remember that we, we are human. And, uh, that's one of the challenges I think we are sometimes fighting against, and um, we can we can improve and do better. I help. So it's sort of interesting being from the United States. I sometimes think that the free software community in my country is disadvantaged in a way because so many of the large proprietary software companies are based in the U.S., and this leads to a real. Um, inertia problem in industry and in the government to uh, do things that are really in favor of free and open source software. I also think sometimes we are handicapped by the fact that English is our primary language and English has this sort of horrible problem that the word free has multiple definitions. And so when we talk about free software, the difference between uh, gratis and Libra is hard to, to explain to people. And this led to the whole creation of the term open source as a, a sort of alias, but not really for free software. And it's led to a lot of discussion, a lot of confusion over time. And when I think about, you know, what would it take to make Debian cool again? And what would it take to, to cause Debian to show up on all the mobile devices in the world? I think in order to get there, you know, we have to somehow figure out how to make sure that our mission and our messages and the things that we're focusing on um, stay fresh without losing sight of the original sort of fundamental set of objectives that the people who started and put a lot of early energy into this project cared about. And if you go back and read the Debian Manifesto, or if you look at the social contract, or you think about the Free Software Foundation's Four Freedoms, all of those things are even more important today than they ever have been in the past. And yet it's really, really easy for some of those fundamental values to get lost in the noise because there's so much going on and so many things that we're all talking about. And so I worry that somehow with so much stuff being worked on that we have so many things to talk about that we forget sometimes the importance of focusing on some of those core original values, which are still, I believe, a really significant part of why Debian can and should and must continue to exist. Okay. Thank you very much. So I just want to do a quick uh, sum up about the, the ideas about I have here to overcome the challenges. So diversity is, is a good thing to get like, open up to more people to join the community. And then we talk about the tool that have uh, developer to engage, uh, to work with uh, the project, and also um, uh, how to motivate people. Yeah, Different way, different suggestions, not only about money, but you know that it's not direct uh, money, but people could be motivated in a way to work in the project, and it leads to more opportunity for them in the future. That is something that we can uh, go around, like send out a message, and then we have something to um, um, uh, create um, an environment where people can meet more often. Face-to-face uh, -face discussion is always good. And then uh, we want uh, Debian to run on uh, more mobile devices. And um, what I have here is then finally we have Peter talking about whatever we do, we need to have a clear vision and we need to, to focus on our core values. Um, not like to, to many different projects. And finally, just one last question before we open up the floor to the audience. Uh, if you could change one thing, what, what would that be? Just one. Yeah, just one. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so if it's uh, too, it doesn't matter. If it's too difficult to answer this question, then I would like to open the floor to, to the audience. We have about um, six minutes for you to interact with the panelists. Hello. Um, 
when you asked the question, what was the most difficult bug you fixed? I'm, I do not remember, but I remember the most difficult bug I was able to, uh, to put on somebody else, which was <laughs> <laughs> uh, um, the, uh, an outreach student, and he uh, took uh, two weeks for this, but it was really cool. I probably I would have taken longer, and she reported on the DEPCON on it, and I think it's more. Uh, Spreading the workload to, to young people is also something I remember more lively than maybe other things I needed to fix. And any other question? Or some idea? So how do you, you can reach out to, to more people? Like in Guatemala, if people, young people nowadays care about having a good job and earn more money. So how do we motivate them to contribute into a free software project? Any idea? Uh, we have one. not a very big idea it's just sometimes uh, needs are very very local and very very specific to the people involved so I remember hearing a story about getting grandmothers learning grandmothers learning how to code motivated by their need to uh, have access to photos of their families who are far away so it was just photo management and so they were motivated to do that it's just, it's just a little thing but I think it exposes a principle of solving the need presented by the people who you're trying to help. Yeah. Uh, maybe an idea is to attract people before they are in, at the age that they need money. Because if you talk to to kids, uh, they, it's usually easier to relate, um, to express them our values and why we think free software is important. And since they don't have to think about money yet, then they can already uh, share some values with us. Because if we wait until they are young, new professionals, then it's more difficult. Yeah, I, I totally agree with you. So um, recently I visited a high school in Vietnam in Hanoi, and I was really surprised that most of the students there use Arch Linux. You know, it, most of the people in the university, even university students, I see they all use Windows, but then they went to high school, they actually started to use Linux already at a very young age. So it's a very good suggestion to reach out to younger generation, and it's the job of teacher like you. So more people should become teacher and bring free software ideas into, into school. Or even your kids, so, uh, Andres, you have kids, right? Oh, they are. I uh, okay, so I saw a few children here. I hope they all become DBN contributors in the future. <laughs> Any more questions for our panelists? Over here, please. Uh, to, oh, uh, to, the, to the previous question about um, what can we do to sort of uh, bridge the goals of financial incentive and, and also helping the community. Uh, at uh, actually at our company Hudson River Trading, we, we do summer internships for college students. And this year, what we did was uh, just paid college students to fix open source bugs. Um, so now they get a feather in their cap for their resume. Uh, they get some experience. Maybe we hire them to do uh, general purpose development, but at the same time, give back uh, you know to the community and to the people. Uh, for some things that uh, were requested in the first place. I, um, I, I think the main challenge in like bringing new people inside Debian is that we have a strong culture of scratching our own itch. So basically, we welcome people that want that have an issue and want to fix it inside the project. Um, we are starting to shift towards having a few lists of things that people could do, uh, but we don't really have time to do. Um, 
but this is like a very, very marginal uh, part of the project. There's the, for instance, in the bug tracking system, there's a newcomer tag mm -hmm. uh, that maintainers can use to mark bugs as being fixable and uh, by newcomers. And uh, basically, they're offering mentorship to get uh, the bugs fixed. But this is really a very, very tiny um, part of uh, the issues that the project has. And it's been a challenge for a few years to get actual uh, internship subjects uh, for the outreach team. Uh, I don't know how to fix it. So. Uh, mentorship, I actually, I have a question about how do you practice mentorship here in Deviant community? I know that Jonathan wrote an article about you got your boss to be like a very good mentor in the beginning. So how is it here? So um, I think the main uh, the main area where there's mentorship in Debian is uh, packaging. Uh, we have a few processes uh, that are in place to actually um, get people to um, well maintain new packages or update existing packages. Um, I think there's uh, some initiatives around Debian Science as well. Uh, mentorship of the month uh, is that still running? Oh, yeah, so, oh, it's working. Uh, should I start from the beginning, probably? No. Well, uh, we are doing uh, this, this mentoring of the month, and I get three to four people uh, finishing one package per year, so f starting from scratch and uh, to a um, ready package. And it's frequently, these are upstream uh, developers who learn packaging, and then they are most competent people, way more than, than we ourselves. And this is, um, I, I really try to propagate this because other teams could do this as well. Uh, any other question? Okay, so we have time for one more question. Uh, I totally agree that uh, Debian use uh, more young people to join. So I am here I am just uh, challenging when Debian conf ru uh, rules that encourage uh, diversity people to join DevConf over 35 years old. <laughs> <laughs> that, that rule needs to change. <laughs> to, uh, to add uh, one rule, uh, if the diversity people under 35 years is also welcome. Yes, <laughs> it, yeah, you're right. <laughs> Okay, so everyone, so uh, we have come to the end of our panel. Please, a big round of applause for our panelists here. Big round of applause, please. And um, thank you very much for sharing your story, your experience, and thank you, the audience, for your participation. Uh, again, final reminder, please go to the website on the volunteer page and sign up for some ship. Thank you very much. <laughs>